how's everybody doing? This is my third session, so I'm wide awake at this point. <laughs> All right, uh, we're about to get started. Thank you. All right, uh, my name is Dr. Kwame Anderson, and I work at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I am the vice president of the programs department, and most of my work day to day includes me running the Leadership Institute where I oversee the internship program, the Congressional Fellowship Program, and also award scholarships as well as the Study Abroad Program. But I had a previous life coming before prior to coming to CBCF and I worked in health policy for about 15 and a half years. And that's really where my passion is. And because of that, they have given me responsibility for the health programming at the CBCF. So this session that you're sitting in was a brainchild of mine a few months ago because I really wanted to examine where are we with the wave of the, fu med the future of medicine. And the future of medicine is precision medicine, which is genomics. And it's a very technical topic, but I think with the people that we have here today, you will learn so much and walk away better informed about what genomics research is all about and what it can do and how with this type of research we can help to eliminate health disparities. So on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, I would like to welcome you here to each and every one of you. This is kicking off the conference and we're happy to have you uh, partake with us and hopefully be able to have information you can take home that is not just practical but useful to help change the fabric of the communities in which you live. Uh, I would like to start off by thanking our sponsor, Global Blood Therapeutics. And could you stand please, Dr. Ted Love, who's president and CEO of Global Blood Therapeutics. He will be speaking on the panel today about some of the work they're doing in the pharmaceutical industry as it pertains to uh, drugs, to uh, therapeutics for sickle cell. Uh, the first person that I'd like to bring up is a big sister of mine. I don't say that lightly. Uh, <laughs> she is someone who's helped to groom me in the sorority that I'm a member of. And I'll let you all guess, but uh, no, you don't have to guess, I'm a Delta. <laughs> and she keeps me in line, and that is big sister Patricia W. Lattimore. Please come forward. Thank you, Kwame, for not saying any more than you did. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, as Kwame said, I'm Pat Lattimore. I'm the CEO of the Delta Research and Educational Foundation. I'm probably the only non-medical, non-doctoral person you will hear from today. But I still think we have a real important role in the world of genomics, as well as in NIH's All of Us Research Project. We were awarded an other uh, transactional award grant from NIH through our leader, Dr. Heron Richardson, and we are working with three other community engagement partners to raise awareness and drive traffic to the genome project, all of us. Uh, we are our task in our respective communities, and we represent the African American community, a 50 forward group community, a LGBT focused community, and a Hispanic initiative focused community, is to drive awareness about the critical need for us to participate in critical trials if research of the future is going to benefit us and our families and our generations going forward. I am pleased that the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, as well as the National Council of Negro Women, have partnered with us. We're working on our engagement plans. We plan to reach out and tap 12 cities that NIH has identified for us to target. And being Deltas, we typically sometimes go places we weren't directed just because that's what we do. Uh, so we may find some other cities to engage in. But in the coming months, uh, probably starting after October, I believe, you will probably find us in Birmingham, Nashville, Memphis, Houston, New Orleans, Albuquerque, Portland, Sacramento, Durham, Greensboro, Columbia, and Greenville. That's where we will be targeted. And if we can get other parts of our organizations equally engaged, 
uh, of course, recognize them with a federal grant without asking for more money, but if we can get them equally engaged for the same dollars, we will. We look forward to reaching out to all of your communities because we've decided that we are no longer gonna take the dregs from the table. We wanna be in the mainstream of the research that addresses our issues and benefits us. Thank you. Thank you, big sister Pat Lattimore. You see them Deltas doing some big things. All right, so I would like to acknowledge Sandra Long, uh, who's the editor of HB CU Research Magazine, this magazine right here. Ms. Long, are you here? All right. Oh, you're welcome. Thank Daryl. Thank Mr. Hamlin. <laughs> but uh, they are doing genomics research. Is that correct? Genomics research? Okay, and we will be able to pinpoint some of the HBCU research that is focused around genomics. That's what Dr. Donna Christensen will be talking about today. She'll enlighten us on what our HBCUs are doing because we all have a role to play, right? right. All right. Okay, so I would like to at this time bring forward the man of the hour who will get us through this conversation and take us to the promised land. And that man is Dr. Thomas Leviste. Dr. Leviste is chairman of the Department of Health Policy and Management at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. He joined GWU after 25 years on the faculty of the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where he was the Na William and Nancy Richardson Professor in Health Policy and Director of the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solution. That's a big job, isn't it? He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, his doctorate degree in medical sociology from the University of Michigan, and postdoctoral fellowship in gerontology and health management and policy at the Michigan School of Public Health. So he will lead the discussion and bring forth the panelists, and I'm turning it over to him. Thank you, Dr. Lavise, and thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Sorry about that. A little housekeeping we had to get done. And um, so Kwame, thank you for that, um, reading that bio, make, making me feel old. 25 years at Hopkins, you know, a quarter of a century. I'd like to ask my panelists, if you, uh, my, my colleagues on the panel, to please come forward. Given the topic of today's panel, um, I anticipate that there's gonna be a lot of discussion, a lot of interest from the audience. And so what we're gonna to try to do is to limit the, limit the speechification, if you will, uh, from the podium, and, uh, and kinda of try to get right into it. So in, uh, while my bio was read, and I appreciate that, I, I'm going to not read the bios, if you don't mind, my, uh, with the permission of my colleagues, and ask that you uh, refer to the programs that were left at, your, uh, at the seats. And so we're gonna begin with a presentation by uh, Dr. George Dun uh, Dunstan, Georgia Dunstan, who is gonna give an overview of genomics research and a little background. And then we're gonna go into, and I'll just ask each panelist to come up um, after uh, the other is, is complete um, and give the presentations. Uh, Dr. Delegate Donna Christensen will be uh, uh, a panelist. Uh, then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Dunstan, we'll hear from Dr. Love, and then finally, uh, Dr. Richardson Parent. Right. We're going in different order. Okay, we have changed the order. So we are going to hear first from Dr. Dunstan, right? So we'll go in that order. So I'll just ask each of you to just come up. We'll go right through the panel, uh, your presentations. We're gonna try to keep those presentations to eight to 10 minutes or less. And then we're gonna open it up and try to have uh, as much time available for conversation as possible. Good afternoon. Yeah. I want to first thank uh, uh, Kwame for the invitation to be a part of this panel. And um, 
Uh, I want to say that the title for this session was for me very inspiring. And still I rise. I don't know who was the originator of that, but it is so appropriate for our discussion here on the role of genomics in eliminating health disparities. I also want to thank our moderator for the introduction <laughs> to be introduced. And I want to get us started with um, my charge is to acquaint us with genomics in general, and specifically, I was asked to comment on what we are doing also at Howard University. All right. Now, I also understand everyone should have a handout of the slides so that if for some reason the reading is not projected large enough, you will be able to follow, okay? Um, the plan is to go through the slides and then leave the uh, uh, remainder of the time to underscore the points that lead us into the other dis uh, discussions. I did take this opportunity on the front slide to acknowledge that um, um, I am located at the National Human Genome Center at Howard University, and this is Howard University's 150th anniversary year, the sesquicentennial, and our logo is shown on the left of, of my name there with the logo representing 2017 for the National Human Genome Center. The next slide, and I'm in control. I put this slide in to identify what I consider the, the triple crown of the third millennia that we are in now. And the three elements of the Triple Crown, the first being the Human Genome Project set the stage for where we are today, with that project being completed in the year 2003. So at the turn of the century, 2K introduced the genome era of medicine. During that era, we've the first level, I'd like to put it this way, the third millennia represents the millennia of the mind. It is the century, the first hundred years, the century of consciousness. The first 10 years, the decade of discovery. And I have identified the uh, public health initiatives for the first decade and then the second decade is what you see here. The first decade was the sequencing of the human genome itself. And I would say to you, sequencing of the human genome is indeed a game changer, not only for medicine, but for society as well. And we are now in the second decade. But the first decade focused on the decade of discovery. What does the genome have to say about who we are? Two just quick points on that. When the genome was sequenced, one of the first scientific facts to come from sequencing the genome was, first of all, less than one-tenth of one percent of our total inheritance is devoted to all the differences that we see on the outside, what we can see, what we call the phenotype, all the differences we see between human beings color of skin, breadth, width of nose, texture of hair, all of these differences require only less than 1% of our total inheritance. Now, if you consider all of the genetic information to make all of the visible things on the inside, all of our organs, pancreas, heart, lung, the amount of our total inheritance that it takes to make all of the protein parts of our inheritance is less than 2%. So when the genome was sequenced, we needed to reconcile the scientific fact that less than 2% of our total inheritance is needed to make all of what we put 100% of our focus on. That's the body, if you will. We move into the second decade, and we have now the public health introducing the BRAIN initiative. Now, this is an initiative to map all of the genes in the brain, to map 
all, well, the, the genes in the brain were part of the overall, but to map the neurons and how the neurons, the cells of the brain, function. Now, the interesting thing about the rest of the genome that was not defined in the body, NIH leading the effort with then the ENCODE project with the question of what's in this part that we don't see in the flesh or the exons produced. And we find that all kinds of exquisite control mechanism, regulatory mechanisms, are encoded in this part that we don't see in the expressed part. And it led to the recognition that we inherit, as we do the physical body, we inherit those portions that control and regulate what we do see, the physical body. And this led us to recognize that Control and regulation was a key part of our inheritance. It also introduced the need to recognize the mind. I said the millennia of the mind, where understanding the mind in, our, in its relationship to health. The mind controls and regulates the expression of the body. So what's the genetics underlying the control and regulatory mechanisms? And quickly, the brain initiative then required us to begin to look at what's the scientific base for how the mind is expressed. And the brain is the organ for expression of the mind. The brain is that organ that transforms the energy, if you will, of thoughts and feelings and words into things. The genome is the, or, uh, is the unit of expression. First, let me give that working definition of the genome for everyone. The genome itself is the complete set of instructions that each of us inherits from each of our parents when we begin this cycle of biological life as a single cell. The egg has a complete set, 23 chromosomes. When that egg is fertilized by the sperm, 46 chromosomes, we have two complete sets of instructions for making everything we see expressed in that single cell. That whole development process of a one cell to these exquisite bodies with all of the organs and all of the beautiful exterior we see, all of that information is encoded in the genome in each of the cells of the body. The only cells that don't have a genome is the mature red cell that's thrown out their nucleus, but every other cell. So keep that in mind. In that genome, all the information about making all the parts. So when we come to health and want to understand what goes wrong in health and how to fix those parts, the <laughs> genome becomes, uh, some call it the manufacturer's handbook for all the parts. But it's not only making the parts, it's how to put the parts together in working order to give the whole individual. The brain initiative, how indeed, what role does the mind play in the functioning and expression of the brain in this regard? And then lastly, where we are today at the crux of the matter, in uh, while the brain initiative was 2013 under Obama's era, but in 2015, Obama, in his State of the Union, announced the Precision Medicine Initiative. And as shown here, that initiative, indeed, asking how do we use the knowledge that we have on the body, how do we use that to provide care, the best care to the individual? And the shift is, with the Genome Project started, it was largely focused on population groups, epidemiologists' study of disease in populations. And so a lot of the information was based on well-designed studies of groups, population. But precision medicine requires us to apply the knowledge to the individual. And what might be true of the population may not be true of an individual in the population. Precision medicine is now being able to apply that to the individual. But let me, so, so that's where we are. That's a summary slide of the, the, the scientific uh, foundation that we're talking about. Let me now move quickly. I want you, how many people got their cell phone weapon? I brought this, okay. This is the instrument to use to explain the genome today. 
This genome that we have in each cell of our body is a living information and communication system. I might even say that science is just getting to the point in its knowledge base of being to compare, to, be, to have something to relate to the knowledge in the genome. The genome is a living information and, com and, and, um, and a communication system. We can, through this cell phone, communicate with persons right next to us, persons across the globe. Direct, some, some folks stay in communication. But it's also a device that allows us to hook to the internet and have access to the world's information on almost any subject you want to ask about. And that's just the best that man has right now. The genome was doing this from day one. It has all the information on how to make the body, how to operate it, how to run it. And it is communi in communication with every cell of the body, the trillions of cells. Each would have the genome, and they communicate as to what's going on. And where we are today is just using the knowledge of where science is now to be a, a way to make a connection to where the genome has always been. The genome as an, a living system. The two main domains of the genome would be biology and identity. Most of the focus has been on the biology, but the bigger part of the genome has come and been sequenced so that we can know about that part of our inheritance in our identity. I like to include this slide, and if you would turn to this real quickly, because I want you to appreciate that the genome is in every cell of the body, but the cells in development work together in community to give rise to a higher order of biological organization, the tissue. Tissues, different tissues work together to give rise to a higher order, the organs. Organs work together to give rise to a higher order, the systems. The systems of the body work together to give rise to a higher order, the individual. It doesn't stop there because our borders stop there, because individuals are not random. They are constituted in families that give rise to a higher order. Families give rise to populations as a population group. And if the genome with this information is so exquisite from the molecular or the micro level to give rise to expressions of life at higher orders, would it stop at the boundaries of humankind itself? Could it be that humankind itself is nested in yet a higher order? And I believe that's the time we're in, that we are beings that have inheritance to exist and give expression to life in the universe. That's where we are now. We'll focus on the globe and we'll bring that together, but our inheritance has already equipped us for life in the universe. And this slide, I just want to point out the area that science has not delved into with the exquisiteness that it has with others is cultural diversity. We've looked at biological diversity, and you see the areas there, family history, biology, disease, gender, age. And we've looked at environmental parameters that are differences, climate, parasites, pollutants, smoking, alcohol. But this area of cultural diversity is one where we have to be involved because it's the cultural diversities that take into account people's different belief systems and their attitudes, what they think about, and how that's related to their biology. And this is where, indeed, all of us come really front stage. Genomics is not something we can sit on the sidelines and look to see what's get happening for everybody else. This is personalized, it is precision, and it is targeted to the individual. Precision medicine forces us to look at how we as individuals are nested into larger groups, but how care can be provided for the whole individual. Just quickly, now wind it down here. Howard University just last year, 2016, 
open cut ribbon on is interdisciplinary research building. The introduction to a time when HBCUs must be involved in this stage of science. Collaborative research, our focus is how do we bring the strengths of academia together with the strengths of the community, together with the strengths of business. Genomics is big business. And it's an area that Daryl and I have had lots of conversation on. Our challenge is how do we, the best of business is providing services that are needed. So how do we look at the economic empowerment of our community by getting involved in the kind of uh, data and results with big business? I just put this slide, you're not to read it. I just wanted to say that this M genome is an information source about life. You want to know something about what, what gene is involved in a given disease? It's in the genome. You want to know something about your family ancestry? How you relate? It's in the genome. You want to know something about human origins, migrations, adaptation? It's in the genome. Moreover, it goes from translation to transformation. It's the inside story. It's about what's happening inside. It's not the person that you're looking at through your physical eyes. It's who's inside the seeing. Because science now tells us that this brain is an organ that uses images. And this brain is an organ that is able to take the images that we have of ourselves, of others, of whatever. And it takes the information that we think, that we speak, what we say, and it gives us a living experience of that image. And it really shows us that we are made to be able to envision what we want. Once we have the vision, we've been gifted with a genome that already is in place to make that vision manifest. That's what it does. It is our creative center. Now, moving quickly to put that in place where we are now at Howard, Howard was also one of 10 HBCs last year. Well, actually, the grant was two years ago, but 10 HBCs across the nation that, were, that was funded by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They had a program called Science for Seminaries. Howard has a school of divinity and, of course, arts and science. We were able to get one of the grants. But the grant was focused on how do we bring the scholarship of the divinity that deals with the spiritual, how do we bring that identity to bear on the scholarship of the arts and sciences that deal oftentimes with the physical? So our focus is how do we actually bring spirituality, the best of spirituality, and the best of science together. And we have a program we call Soul Genomics. And to me, that's so appropriate for us as a people. We brought soul food. We brought soul music. When we come into the genomics arena, our charge is to use science, the best science, to validate and authenticate the soul, not only as the essence of our identity, but that part of our inheritance that's responsible for everything we see expressed through mind and body. The soul is that invisible part that works through the genome, which brings forth all of the physical characteristics we see. And it brings us to my concluding slides. I will have you see we're shifting genomics and recognizing that the control and regulatory part of our inheritance, which is vested in the soul, which is expressed in and through the mind as well as the body, shifts the paradigm. Shifts the paradigm from the molecular biochemistry chem level to the biophysical, from the physical to the mental, from translation, which is on a lateral, just one way of saying it in different ways, to transformation, which is vertical, connects, if you will, <laughs> earth to heaven, if you will, and makes us aware that we move from a focus in the third millennia to the body to a focus on the mind. And uh, with that mind understanding and how the mind works in terms of health, we move from a focus on disease 
to the mechanisms of health. Whole sequence in the whole genome gives us all the information for making every part, which gives us another view into how we intervene in correcting things that get out of order. We move from death and dying to life and living. We move from the classical, the time ordered, the limited, to the quantum level of life, which is unlimited, which is timeless. And I close with these quotes from persons that are familiar to you on the question of identity. If the genome has come to give us solid facts on identity, then perhaps we can understand what Martin Luther King said on identity when he said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. We are now in a position to put metrics around character, and we can use this genome to match, to, to relate to character aspects, just like we relate to physical uh, aspects. And also Mandela, after his experience, and he became the leader of South Africa, made this statement in his opening. We ask ourselves, who am I? You are a child of the universe. You are born to make manifest the glory of God, which is in each one of us. And we are liberated, as we are liberated from our own fears, our presence automatically liberates others. And the last slide before the acknowledgement brings us to where we are now with, uh, with Daryl and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Christensen. What's the role of HBCUs at this point in time? I say the challenge is that every problem is a lack of knowledge. Research is the generation source of knowledge. The product of research is knowledge. We must, in our HBCUs, do the research and own the knowledge required to reclaim our inheritance, restore our health, rebuild our communities, repair our cities, and transform our world. And this quote from a Ghanaian poet, until the lions tell their own story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. We got to do it. And you, you have the people that I want to acknowledge is on the handout as well. We have quite a team. So, so maybe as we wait to get the technology to work, that uh, if there are any uh, questions or uh, that you may have for Dr. Dunstan. The, the question was, how long have we known about the genome? The actual genome itself, our inherited material genetics goes back, I would say one of the first landmark dates is um, Watson and Crick's model of DNA. 
okay? And that was in the 50s, 1953, yes. We learned that we have this material called DNA that carries the information about inheritance. Now, the Genome Project itself, the um, actually determined, uh, I didn't mention this, but DNA is made up of four chemicals, essentially. And the human genome contains on the order of three billion of these four chemicals. And so, as I pointed out in one of the slides, information in the genome is structured in the patterns of variation of these four. And that's why we are also so important to engage in this phase because black people, as the foundation of humankind, human ours, contain, and the data show the broadest spectrum of variation is in our genome. And we need to be involved in the studies, yesterday's session on clinical trials, because our genome has a unique capacity to help us hone in and find those things in the genome that's tied to whatever we're trying to look for. But that was 2001, when we had the first draft of the genome, and then the project was completed in, turn, in terms of determining, determining the order of these four that are at the billion level was 2003. Right here in the beautiful spot. They are ready. Wait, 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 one, one second. So there are a lot of people here that don't that don't are not the, that don't have a lot of background in the science. So let me just ask first. Can we get a definition of what we mean by precision medicine? Because I think this is getting to where we need to get. And let me ask uh, Dr. Lowe if you can provide that, that answer, please. Yes, yeah, so people know my background goes back to Genentech, where we actually started to make some of the first precision medicine drugs, one being Herceptin, which is a drug for breast cancer, which actually targets a mutation that has occurred in the cancer. So precision medicine is really about finding a target which is absolutely unique and going after that target. Prior to drugs like Herceptin, we would have, we would really try to fight cancers by going after DNA replication. And since the cancers are replicating faster, that could have a favorable effect on the cancer, but you were affecting all cells replicating. When you go after a unique target, you can really hit that target very effectively because that target doesn't exist in other cells. So it really is, it's about precision, like precision bombing. You're trying to go precisely where you want to go and not affect areas where you don't want to have an effect. Okay, our next, <clears throat> our next speaker is ready. So we're going to uh, continue with the program and we'll get back to the con uh, questions and answers uh, as soon as we're finished. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Dara Richardson Heron, the Chief Engagement Officer for the All of Us Research Program at the National Institutes of Health. And I'd first like to thank Dr. Dunstan for taking me back to medical school and church at the same time. <laughs> I'd also like to express my heartfelt thanks and appreciation to CBCF President and CEO Shanice Washington, the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee Chair, Dr. Kwame Anderson, VP of Programs, and really all of the leaders and members of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for the gracious invitation for me to join you today. I also have to express my uh, personal gratitude to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for always being at the forefront of informing policy and educating the public on the key issues affecting our community. You know, it's an honor um, 
to speak today alongside such a distinguished panel of leaders who are really thinking light years ahead in their field on how to enhance lives through genomics, which you've learned a lot about, probably more than you ever wanted to know. But like Dr. Dunstan says, we cannot sit on the sidelines. Indeed, we must know about our genomes, the elements that make us all unique. And it's so it's really exciting to join each of you on this journey as we seek ways to identify opportunities to change the face of health and health care as we know it. And in so doing, make significant advances that will one day, hopefully very soon, allow us to eliminate the many unfortunate and unacceptable health disparities that plague our community. So, while I profoundly and proudly and very appropriately applaud all the incredible accomplishments and longstanding contributions of the past, I'm here today because despite all of the impactful strides that have been made and the hard fought fights that have been won, unfortunately, we all know that there is so much more work to be done, particularly as it relates to the health and well being of the African American community. That's why I'm so excited to be here both as a physician by trade and an advocate by choice to tell you about a new and exciting initiative that is underway to help us all gain a better understanding of and identify information that will help us use research as a powerful change agent to advance scientific discovery and personalized treatments designed to enhance health and health care for all of us. So, Dr. Dunstan talked a little bit about precision medicine. Precision medicine uh, is a bold new research effort that seeks to change how we improve health and treat disease in the United States. <coughs> we want to deliver a new era of medicine through research, technology, and policies that empower patients, researchers, and providers to work together with communities towards the development and indi individualized or personalized care. As you know, it's a collaborative effort among many agencies across the federal government. And the All of Us research program that I'm a part of is a key element and cornerstone of this initiative. And I'm particularly proud and pleased to report that our initiative continues to be a top priority for our nation's leaders, and we continue to have significant bipartisan support for this project. Since its unveiling in 2015, we have slowly been putting the building blocks together to launch a truly collaborative effort. So as the chief engagement officer of this program, let, let me be clear. This is no small project. It's a game changer. We aim to enroll one million Americans or more in the largest research program of all time. And I'm really proud to share that the All of Us Research Program is different not only in being the biggest undertaking of its kind, but because from the very beginning, one of the program's overarching goals is to address and change the reality that there are huge communities in the United States that currently neither have a voice in, nor do they benefit from the advances in medical research. So when we succeed, and I do mean when, not if, when we succeed with your help and active participation, we will have the power to transform medicine, to give healthcare professionals more tools to treat patients based on their individual specific needs, and thus we will be one huge step closer towards our collective goal of eliminating the many unfortunate health disparities plaguing our communities. So I talked about our program having bold goals. This landmark longitudinal research effort was designed to gather, again, one million or more people living in the United States. And it seeks to build the largest and most diverse research cohort of all time with the ultimate goal of accelerating research and improving health for all. We will gather data over many years. It's a longitudinal study. We think we'll go for at least 10 years. And this data will allow researchers to learn more about how individual differences in biological makeup, lifestyle, how you live, and the environment where you live can influence health and disease. Now, building this large cohort will require innovation. And that's why the All of Us Research Program is taking a transformational approach to diversity. Indeed, our goal is to achieve quadruple diversity, diversity of people, geography, health status, and data types. And we're committed to ensuring that all communities, especially those who have been 
historically underrepresented in biomedical research have the opportunity to participate in and benefit from this initiative. The program will not be successful if we don't do that. And this includes both healthy and sick individuals from all walks of life and all socioeconomic backgrounds and from all regions of the country. Now, you know, let's just be honest. A very important part of my role is thinking about the value proposition for those of us who are underrepresented in research. And the truth is a value proposition alone won't sell itself, and for good reason. This slide gives a chilling snapshot of many of the well-known transgressions that have occurred over the years. The first, as many of you know, is Henrietta Lacks, an African-American woman who sought treatment for cervical cancer back in 1951. Her cells were taken without her knowledge, and these cells have been used extensively in scientific research and have made possible some of the most important medical advances of the past 60 years, including the development of modern vaccines, cancer treatments, in vitro fertilization, and many others. And none of us will ever forget the Tuskegee syphilis study where researchers were dishonest with hundreds of black men telling them that they were being treated, but in truth, they did not receive the proper treatment needed to cure their il illnesses. Now, I'm sure you're saying, well, is she trying to convince us to participate or is she trying to discourage us? You know, we can't let the transgressions of the past prevent us from moving forward. These are just a couple of examples but they involved real people, real families, and real communities. And they have understandably led to many minorities being hesitant or skeptical when considering whether or not to share their medical information or participate in clinical research. And the result, though, of our community's hesitancy has sadly led to limited re research into what most affects us, which contributes to our community very often not being on the receiving end of the benefits of research. Now, none of us can wave a magic wand and, and erase the past, but our job, number one, is to genuinely and with overwhelming respect and empathy acknowledge the legitimate fear, concerns, and mistrust these unfortunate historic acts instill in many of the communities we're attempting to engage. But after we do this, we need to pivot very quickly and make everyone understand how important it is for everyone to be involved in research, and particularly the All of Us Research Program. Now, I have to understand that, and, and I have to make it clear to you that our program is different. We're unprecedented in the core values that you see here. Most research doesn't start off with core values. But we know that in order to work and regain and rebuild the trust that has been lost by so many, we have to have values that resonate with everyone. And I personally served on the advisory group that helped to craft these core values. They're incredibly important to me as I travel around the country to promote this program. Indeed, my own personal credibility is on the line each and every time I stand before a group like you and talk about this program. And I wouldn't be here, trust me, if I didn't per personally believe in this promise. I'm employable, trust me. <laughs> But the benefits of this program are enormous, and particularly for the communities who have been left out. So let me share a little bit about why our program is different. First of all, we have a transformational approach to participation. The one million volunteers in this program will be true partners, not patients, not subjects. They'll be true partners in the research program. They'll be involved in every step of the program development, what we collect, what lab analysis we do, what research is conducted, and how that data gets returned to them. And we want patients and participants to stay with us for a long time, but it's their choice whether or not they stay or go. We have a transformational approach to data access. With the program, we're going to, as I said, we're building one of the largest data sets for health research. It's going to be accessible to researchers, providers, and even citizen scientists with the appropriate safeguards to accelerate scientific breakthroughs. Indeed, the program is using the highest standards of privacy and data security to protect participant information. And our goal is to make as much information available as possible to researchers from all backgrounds, including citizen scientists, because we want this program to democratize research and provide broader access to many more scientists who are interested in positively impacting health and healthcare. So what exactly do we expect to learn? Well, we hope that researchers will use the data that we collect to develop estimates of risk 
for a range of disease. We hope researchers will use the data to help identify the causes for individual variation in response to commonly used medications. We all have a grandmother or sister or aunt who said, I'm not taking that medicine because it doesn't make me feel right. Well, they're probably right because it wasn't designed for them because they didn't participate in the study that helped develop it. We want researchers to look for unique biological markers that signal increased or decreased risk of developing common diseases. Many of you may be familiar with the breast cancer gene, the BRCA genes that signal an increased risk for developing breast cancer. Our All of Us research program platform can enable trials of targeted treatments and therapies that might be beneficial for some populations and perhaps not others. The potential benefits of this program are enormous, but through it all, we want to empower also our participants with data to inform themselves how to improve their health and the health of their families for generations to come. Now, we're well aware that this is an ambitious project and the road ahead may not be easy, so we're coming at engagement in three fronts outlined here. Our healthcare provider organizations, which include major medical centers, federally qualified healthcare centers, and the Veterans Affairs Hospital, are designing their own unique engagement approaches tailored to their local communities. There are current laboratories and they can, they can share information to help us understand which mes messages are resonating with which communities. And, and they're building organizational support as well as community support for what we're trying to do. And we have a team of engagement experts. And Rima Matsumoto he is here with our um, HCM strategist. She is working with me and my team to make sure that we are blanket in the nations with community partners like the Delta Research and Education Foundation, so aptly led by Patricia Lattimore, and others who are going to help us in our work. And we have stars like, we have stars like um, Dr. <laughs> our amazing doctor here, Dr. Robert Wynn, who is the co-PI of our Illinois Consortium, who is unbelievable in his commitment to the communities that he serves. We want to listen to the community and make sure that they are heard. So, we're currently in the beta phase of our program, or the testing phase of our program. As we get closer to launching our program, we're developing even more specific ways for people to partner with us. I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation about how we might partner together in this great effort. Without question, this is a groundbreaking research program, and it's already creating a great deal of excitement in the scientific community and beyond, and, and there's good reason for that. And I know you may think I'm biased, and I am, but as someone who has had firsthand experience with the healthcare system as a physician, as a 20 year and counting breast cancer survivor, and as an advocate, I am personally ecstatic to be a part of this program designed to make healthcare more precise, more equitable, more personal, and more effective, not just for some, mm -hmm but for all of us. So I thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to your questions. We're gonna, we're gonna ask that you hold your questions until the end of the panel, and we'll, we'll have a, a discussion at that point. Or well, maybe not. Why don't we take one question? Uh, I think you, we'll take one, one here, and then there was one over on this side as well. Re repeat the question. So the question is, who are we looking um, to participate in the program? We want truly all of us, everyone, people who are healthy, people who have disease, people um, from all diverse backgrounds, all walks of life, because what we want to do is collect information. The reason why we need uh, a million or more participants is that with that large amount of, of data, we can actually identify trends and identify specific 
um, characteristics that might be unique to one population or a group of people or the other. So the short answer to your question is we're looking for everyone to be a part of this study, particularly those who have been um, traditionally underrepresented. Um, and that it's typically African Americans and other Hispanic, other minorities. Okay, our next speaker is ready and I'll give you the first question at the end. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. What an honor to be a part of this panel. And I'm always pleased to be back with the CBC and the ALC. Tells me there's life after Congress, which is always a good thing. And I want to thank Kwame and the rest of the folks at CBCF for inviting me. But the, it's really an honor to be with this panel, um, many of whom are my icons and who have not only informed the work that I've been able to do, but have inspired me along the way. And I don't pretend to be, like Ms. Lattimore, I don't pretend to be an expert in this area, but what I lack in expertise, I hope I make up for in passion about health equity and eliminating health disparities. So I'm glad to be a part of this discussion to bring some of I, what I have been privileged to be involved in through the Emerging Technologies Consortium, the CEO of which, Daryl Hamlin, is here with us today. Daryl, stand up and let them see who you are. If we're serious about ensuring that precision medicine and any other of the new age technologies reach our African American community, our HBCUs must be involved. And they must be involved at the outset, doing basic research and development. So that's what I intend to focus on in my few minutes and I'll do my best to convey what the Emerging Technology Consortium's path to sustainability is all about. <coughs> Too many HBCUs, which have been lifelines to students and communities for 150 plus years, are losing their competitiveness. And worse, many are, some are at risk of closing. So we have to change this trajectory urgently. One answer is an R&D, as it has been for majority institutions for years. And an average R&D makes up 40% of revenue in majority institutions, but less than 1% in ours. HBCUs, through engaging in basic research and the new businesses that can spawn, can ensure that African Americans are not left behind as transformative advances like precision medicine become state of the art for everyone else. As Dr. Perez Stabler, the director of the National Institute of Minority and Health Disparity Research at NIH has stated, and I'm quoting him here, there are many benefits to recruiting diverse populations to participate in the Precision Medicine Initiative. This rich research resource provides a unique opportunity to understand the health issues impacting all population groups. The benefits extend far beyond the availability of genomics and other biomarkers for diverse populations. It will also include the systemic collection of social information, demographics, and clinical data that will help us understand those mechanisms, as you've heard, and lead to elimination of health disparities. Who better than our HBCUs to ensure this for us? And as demonstrated in a white paper from the Emerging Technologies Consortium, MSIs and HBCUs and our medical schools do have the biomedical research expertise. Four are among the top 200 research institutions, and I have them displayed here on, the, on my slide. Morehouse, Howard, Florida A&M, and Jackson State. But many do not have the research infrastructure to participate in large, complex biomedical research missions. Without the infrastructure, they also tend to lose the expertise to other universities that do. The NIH Precision Medicine Initiative has awarded almost $279 million to develop the foundation for the initiative. Although community health centers involvement has been one way that diverse populations become a part of the initiative, to the best of my knowledge, no HBCU health profession school has itself received an award for the biobank, data research, patient technologies, or as a healthcare provider organization. In fact, until recently, the only HBCU currently receiving PMI funding is Mahari through its alliance with Vanderbilt's award for the Data Research and Support Center. <laughs> We're glad to have heard about the new All of Us Research Program from Dr. Richardson Heron, 
which proactively reaches out to traditionally underrepresented communities like ours and can make a critical difference. At least two of the awardees include HBCUs, Tuskegee and Morehouse, as well as providers and researchers that serve diverse and underrepresented populations, as you've heard. It's a great part of addressing the diversity and ensuring that precision me medicine does not leave us behind. But we do need to go further. If we are to bring our HBCUs and communities into the 21st century, we have to invest more of the federal government and private sector's R&D billions of dollars into our HBCUs. And our, our institutions are at different levels of readiness, and we need to build on the work done by Dr. Ruffin and others to create the infrastructure that qualifies them for the awards and that attracts and retains the high quality researchers who would then leverage even more investment. And the tools to do this are in place. There are not only executive orders that direct all agencies to facilitate li liaisons between the government and HBCUs that would strengthen capacities and create objectives that support them and those not only were in the uh, Obama administration, but they were again reissued under the Trump administration as well. Like the former order under President Obama, it calls on agencies designated by the Secretary of Education to increase capacity, encourage participation, link to private sector and communities, and to develop a plan to do so. But more importantly, there are provisions in law that direct that this must happen. The strongest is the defense appropriation language, which directs the Department of Defense to develop a strategy to develop our capacity for research. All of us, our universities, the organizations that represent us, and our state and congressional leaders need to be timely and aggressive to seize upon these opportunities. We have learned, or we should have learned, that if we're not, nothing or some watered down implementation is what we will get. And our HBCUs will lose and our communities will continue to suffer. The consortium has developed a plan to sustainability project which is supported by the Minority Biz Business Development Agency in Commerce and NIH. And I'm gonna go through some slides to just show what that is. Um, Oh, there are, other, there are other, besides the defense authorization, there are some other programs that also support funding going to HBCUs. The federal funded research and development centers and the university affiliated research centers have language not as strong as the defense authorization and so does the 21st century cures, but that only requires that they make us aware of the opportunities. But the Path of Sustainability Project, I'm not gonna dwell on this slide. This is a summary slide and most of the information is included as I go through the rest of the slide. The, the, um, my, the Path of Sustainability, it implements the intent of the presidential orders through developing public-private partnerships between HBCUs and minority businesses with training and tracking of the opportunities and the outcomes of those um, alliances between our HBCUs and the minority businesses. These are some of the initial te teams. Um, I can't read it here or there. But I hope you can see, we see Hampton University, Meharry, Morehouse, Howard, Charles Drew, um, University of the Virgin Islands, and um, Jackson State already involved in the consortium project. And these are some of the other consortium <laughs> members already in agreements with HBCUs and affiliated with them. Today, there are seven HBCUs and 21 minority businesses involved with federal partners identified, <laughs> agreements in place, and the trainings completed. The sustainability plan begins with sustaining the viability of our HBCUs in the short term, but it has longer term goals of eliminating health inequities and ensuring access to state of the art treatment modalities for everyone and improving the health of African Americans and other people of color, but it doesn't end there. 
It also has the further intention and goal of creating economic development through providing business opportunities and jobs based on that research that the HBCUs would do in the communities where those institutions reside and in the surrounding areas. So what needs to happen? We need to ensure that we assess the HBCU and MSI medical schools and research institutions capacity to participate in the next generation of where am I? Biomedical research. We need to identify the potential pre precision medicine activities that they could participate in, especially those that would contribute to the elimination of health disparities. We need to determine the required structure that would enable MSIs and M HBCUs to effectively conduct those research activities. And we need to develop the industry partnerships needed to enable minority businesses and communities to economically benefit from the research of, from the results of the research and the potential commercialization of that research. But it also requires a paradigm shift in how our HBCUs plan and seek funding support. From depending on loans that we have difficulty in paying back, and depending on student tuitions alone. No other, none of the majority institutions do that because it's not sustainable. The heart of the HBCU mission has always been to provide leadership for and to improve the condition of African Americans, not just in isolated sectors, but in ways that comprehensively improve all of us, community by community, with our HBCUs being the catalyst they have always been, but in the transformative ways that are demanded of them today. I believe ensuring our HBCUs participation in this research is key to ensuring that precision medicine does not drive, that HBCU's participation in this research is key to ensuring that precision medicine does not drive further disparities, but instead closes the health gap that has existed for too long in the African American communities and other communities of color. I just want, this quote was just so great. I just want to end with Dr. Dunstan's quote. We must do the research and own the knowledge required to reclaim our inheritance, restore our health, rebuild our communities, repair our cities, and transform our world. Thank you for that, Dr. Dunstan. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I grew up in the South. Uh, I grew up in Alabama in the 60s. And one of the things that someone taught me very early on in my family and my community is that knowledge is power. Did anybody else hear, hear that phrase growing up? Yes. So quite frankly, I'm here because I've really never forgotten that. I've tried to focus on that. And just by way of background, I'm trained as a physician, uh, but also as a scientist. My career really started uh, at Harvard after I finished my training in cardiology on the faculty there. But I left and went off into the drug industry, which was taboo back then. Uh, but I can tell you, I've been involved in making a lot of good drugs that have saved a lot of lives for a lot of people around the world. But one of the things I never really did was use any of my skill sets or any of my background to particularly help the African American community. And one of the things that I recalled is that when I was training, there were these black people typically who came into Yale, who came into the Mass General, and they got terrible care. They were patients with sickle cell disease. I grew up as a black kid in a black community, and I, I didn't really know what sickle cell disease was until I went to medical school. Now, how many people here know what sickle cell disease is? Okay, let me go back to my knowledge is power thing. 
this might be a little boring to you, but I'm going to try to make it interesting to you. One of the things that we need to survive is food. We can go without food for quite a few days, weeks. Another thing we need is water. We can't go so long without water, but we can go days without water. Another thing we need is oxygen. We can't go even minutes without oxygen. And we have been evolutionarily programmed to get, require a lot of oxygen. And the way we do it, and this is gonna come back to sickle cell, the way we do it is through our blood. And our red blood cells, we've been told already, don't have DNA anymore. But they have this protein inside of them called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is effectively a magnet for oxygen. That is why our blood can gather so much oxygen when it's in the lungs, and then that hemoglobin is supposed to let go of that oxygen in the tissues, so it's essentially picking up and dumping it. The way hemoglobin does that is quite fascinating. Hemoglobin has two shapes. It is a shape that's high affinity for grabbing oxygen and a lot of it, and it has another shape that's low affinity where it's supposed to drop the oxygen off. Sickle cell disease is a disease of hemoglobin. And the reason it primarily occurs in African Americans in the United States is that the defect was a replication error in our cells that ended up being protective against malaria. And because there was a lot of malaria, people with this defect began to outnumber or to have a favorite reason to survive versus people that didn't have the defect. Now, you only want one bad gene. One bad gene doesn't make you sick, but one bad gene will protect you from malaria. The problem is you get two bad genes. You are very sick. We brought in slaves to the United States. Some of those slaves had sickle cell trait, which is one bad gene. They were, they were not sick, but they're gonna have children that sometimes have disease. So sickle cell disease is primarily in our community because of a defect that occurred a long time ago, but that defect had a survival advantage in an environment where there was a lot of malaria. Now, why do I even care about sickle cell disease? Now, I can tell you it relates to my knowledge is power thing. Um, in the drug business, we have made extraordinarily drugs, particularly over the last decades. The reason we're making drugs that are so much better is because of knowledge. We really understand the disease and we really understand how to make drugs which really go after that disease. Sickle cell disease was first recognized in the United States, in Chicago, in 1910. 1910. We figured out the genetic basis for the disease in 1949. We knew a long time ago that this disease is caused by the hemoglobin sticking to each other and causing rods that deform the red cell from being a nice kind of tube, like the inner tube in a car, um, into being these sickle cells. And Herrick saw that in 1910 when this dental student came in with this painful crisis and he looked at the blood and he saw these sickle cells. They gave it sickle cell. So why is it that we have had the knowledge and I would submit the power to do something extraordinary about this disease since 1949, yet we are sitting here today and we have lots of drugs for CF, we have lots of drugs for even HIV, but we have no approved drug in this country for children born with sickle cell disease. So that's why I'm here. I had a great career at Genentech. I ran drug development for Genentech. My job was to basically pick the winners and losers because I was in charge of allocating who gets money and who doesn't. And it was, a, it was an interesting job for someone like me that's trained medically and scientifically. But I became pretty good at that job. Um, and I retired, actually. I retired, and I wasn't planning on working as hard anymore. Um, 
But I got a call one day from some friends who were in the venture world, and they said, Ted, we want to, saw, we want to start a company whose focus is to solve sickle cell disease. And that caught my attention. That caught my attention, and the reason it caught my attention is because of the science. Because what these guys were up to is making a drug that would bind to the hemoglobin and stop it from polymerizing. And if you could do that, even a dumb guy like me knows, you've gone up, this is like HIV. You can, you can give people pentamidine, you can give people prophylactic antibiotics for opportunistic infections, but if you kill that virus, you've got a pretty normal person on your hands. In sickle cell disease, if you could stop that polymerization, then you've got a pretty normal person on your hands. So that's how I got here. So let me tell you a little bit about GBT. GBT is about five years old. As I said, it was funded by some venture capitalists, uh, people that I have known for years, who put in $50 million to start this company. So I knew I had a little money. And since then, I've probably raised another $600 million. And we have been plowing like crazy to solve this problem. And just to give you some perspective, when we give this drug to older adults or children with sickle cell disease, we can see they began to, we talked about the phenotype, they began to develop a normal phenotype. Their sickle cell phenotype starts to disappear literally within days. And it's not that surprising because the polymerization is essentially going on every second. And if you stop that, the absence of that begins to manifest itself. Now, how does it manifest itself? Well, first, let's go back to the Herrick experiment in 1910, where Herrick just took the blood from uh, that dental student and looked at it. If you, I take the blood from a sickle cell patient before I give them this drug, and I give them the drug for a week, and I look at their cells, guess what? It's very hard to find any more sickle cells. The sickle cells go away. Um, Sickle cell disease also used to be called sickle cell anemia. It's because people are anemic, because their red blood cells are being destroyed by this polymerization. Guess what happens with the anemia? It starts to go away. Um, we are now in the last stages of drug development. We have moved incredibly fast. We are doing the last trial. It's a big trial, 400 people from around the world, 15 countries, including the United States, and we need your help. We need your help for two reasons. One is that I know that if you know, what's that was that line about Sutton, why do I rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Well, sickle cell disease is very common in Africa, so we have African sites as well. I don't want America to not enroll in our study, though, so you all can help us make sure that people that you know that are affected with this disease get involved in our study. The only way we're gonna make drugs for black diseases is black patients get involved in studies. And this, we're, we're just not gonna be able to get there. White people can't help us because they don't have enough sickle cell disease. We've got to get involved to solve this problem. But, and I predict, by the way, that this is gonna work. I predict that this is going to be a very effective drug for sickle cell disease and that is despite a lot of people turning the other way. Mm -hmm. This is a, a lot of people will have described this as a black problem. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether it's a black problem or not. I think all problems that are egregious and serious, no matter who they affect, need solutions. But to be fair, to be clear, there have not have been a lot of people like me who've been trying to pour their knowledge and their science and their expertise and solve this problem. So that's over. We are trying to solve this problem, and we need your help to make sure that we enroll in studies. I'm just gonna add on one other note. It takes a village to do anything. Mm -hmm. It takes a village to do anything. The one thing I've been pretty good at is using my knowledge and background to help make therapies for serious diseases, but that's only the beginning. We've gotta get these drugs and these therapies out there to people. We've gotta get people under medical care a huge number of sickle cell patients don't even have a doctor. There are hematologists in this country who don't even want to treat sickle cell patients. 
So there's a lot of issues to be solved. We are working on making a great drug, and we need your help in doing that, particularly in the clinical trials. But we are going to need your help to make sure that our drug is accessible and that our brothers and sisters with sickle cell disease are in the healthcare network so that they can be properly cared for. Sickle cell disease, I want to tell you, the cavalry is arriving. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I know there are a lot of questions, and I will, I will note, uh, it's, it's in politics, but I will note that every single one of them went over the 10 minutes, so we do not have nearly as much time as we would hope that we could have. So I'll ask you to ask your questions. I would ask that if you have a statement that you want to make, that you hold it until the panel is over, and then you can make that statement to someone who is willing to listen. But please, questions only. And I want to ask the panelists to please answer the questions as quickly as possible so that we can get as many questions in as possible. So I promised you the first question. Start asking you to come yeah, I'm going to ask you all to go to the microphone. Will you go ahead and ask your question? I will repeat your question. I was trying to save time. But okay, everyone else, please go to the microphones so Hi, we can turn them through. Go. Latasha Lee from the American Society of Hematology. Thank you so much for a very enlightening um, a panel discussion today. Um, my first question is for, um, I believe it's Dara. Mm -hmm. um, and it's involving the um, All of Us um, research program. There's currently an RFI open for p inclusion of pediatric populations into the All of Us campaign. Can you elaborate? And I think the deadline is tomorrow for those of us who are submitting uh, um, letters and comp um, um, application or, uh, responses to the RFI. And then to um, um, Representative Christensen, thank you so much for your remarks on the inclusion of HBCUs in addressing health disparities. As a proud product of HBCU, can, can you elaborate on why we need more of us in the field so that we can address some of the disparities that we're seeing? So can I ask you, what is your specific question about the RFI? So I think the RFI currently states that um, the inclusion of pediatric populations, however, the way we wrote our letter, which we actually just submitted today, was that we didn't know if um, disease populations would be included within, but I see from your presentation today that disease populations, including sickle cell disease um, and sickle cell trait can be included. Was there any discrepancies about, or, or concerns about using pediatric populations within the research program, or was this kind of adding uh, further justification for the use of pediatrics? So first, I'll say that um, you know I am not the person to talk about the RFI. I'm sure there's a contact person on there for you to reach out to. But right now, the All of Us program is accepting people aged 18 and above. We're not accepting people under the age of 18 into the research program at this time. Um, and I, I certainly have to answer in this way because I have uh, Ned Colhane, uh, uh, one of our uh, lead uh, uh, um, individuals on our team for strategic relationships and uh, also uh, congressional liaison and just a treatment partnerships. And, and, and so the way that you would get information about the RFI is to reach out to the contact person for that. But the study as we describe now is uh, age 18 and above. And at some point in the future, we will be accepting children. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, there, there, there are several reasons. First of all, um, who better to have the biobank for the African American community than HBCU? Um, HBCUs are not are threatened right now, and we have not taken advantage of an opportunity that keep the majority student institutions open, um, and we need that funding. Um, third, it. If we need to be doing the research that helps our own communities. And in doing so, basic research often, well, turns into a commercial, commercially um, viable um, product that can put our communities to work and increase our economic development. And that's the end goal of, of, of the project. But there, there probably are even many more reasons than that. I wanted to add trust because it's great when you see a panel uh, like this. Okay, Absolutely. We, we really need to move on and give Absolutely. someone else a chance, please. Well, uh, just what she said about trust, thanks to Howard University, I've been in the nurses study for the last 20 years and they would not have gotten my DNA if it wasn't for Howard University. So, but I wanted to know what responsibility do you have once you get results 
and say those results are not really, um, that could potentially cause problems. We don't get the results of the study as an individual. One of the things that we uh, pride ourselves on and really is one of our core values is returning information back to participants. You're absolutely right. Um, in the past, many of the studies, research was done, you come into the community, you get what you need and you leave. That's not what we are doing with the All of Us Research Program. We understand how important it is. If someone gives of themselves and of their time, we should respect them enough to make sure that we are giving back information to them that not only helps them um, enhance their own health, but the health of their families and their communities. So return of value is something that's very important. Hi, my question is for Dr. Love. Do you have any you study are. sites? I'm sorry? I'm Dr. Andrea Phillips. I do clinical trials in Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> do you have any study sites in uh, Mississippi? Are you using mostly university sites? And then my second question is, are you including uh, subjects with SC disease, which is quite prevalent? Yeah, so it's a good, very good question. Uh, we have about 80 sites around the world. About half of those sites are in the US. I don't remember straight away if we have a site in Mississippi, but I can tell you that we have a website which lists every site that we've got, and we have a way where you can contact us if you're interested in creating a site. Uh, but, uh, but, but not all the sites are open yet. About half, I'd say about 20, 25 of the sites in the U.S. are open. My suspicion is we do have a site in Mississippi, but I don't know all the sites. We do have a website that will tell you. Um, and SC, yes, we are including SC. Uh, we did have a requirement in the trial that you have to have had at least one sickle cell crisis in the prior 12 months because we do want patients with symptoms. As you know, some patients with SC can be fairly mild, but if you've got SC disease and you've got symptoms, then you can qualify for the study. And I don't want to, I'm going to say a little comment. I am from a family of ASAC. We came out AA, AS, AC, and SC. And then the AS married an, S, an, an AC, and they have three AC, SC children. So it's, it's, it's quite prevalent, and they do yeah. have crises. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you very much thank for your you. work. Hi. My name is Greg Crossfield. Um, I met Dr. Love because he had a, an Obama fundraiser at his house in California just before the election two cycles ago and have become somewhat good friends that I get to talk with them on the phone every two years, but I haven't seen them in like 10 years. So it's actually great. Uh, Dr. Love, I wanted to thank you for doing work that involves our community because there are a lot of folks that forget sort of where they're from, et cetera. And I didn't have a question. I just want to say it's great to see you and thanks for doing your work. Okay, thank you for that comment. Yeah, that's next. I do have a question and it is for Dr. Love. Good afternoon, my name is Kathy Tosas Mulligan and I'm from the University of Illinois Cancer Center. And my question is for you, Dr. Love. How exactly do you involve the community? Not only, of course, for participation in the trials, but of course, afterwards for results uh, reporting and also for giving back to the community, giving that your corporation. I know how the NIH does it, but how do you guys do it? So um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I am extraordinarily lucky in that I have been able to be part of a great company. Almost everybody at this company is passionate about sickle cell disease. And we've thought about this very carefully. Jung Choi is in the background. She works for our company. Christy is over here. I hope she was anyway. Works for our company. We spent a lot of time in the community before we even started our study. Because we asked people, what do you need? Why do you not participate? They told us sometimes we can't get transportation. They told us people often don't share the results of the study. I mean, all sorts of things. We collected all of that data, and we are committed to solve every problem. For example, people who come in our study, it's a small issue, but if you enroll our study, the first thing we do is give you a debit card with money on it, because we don't want the lack of being able to call an Uber to go into the clinical center to be a, to be a limitation. Uh, we've had people, believe me, have gone 300 miles on our nickel to get to a clinical site. Uh, but we're committed to that, and that's okay. If, if you need care and you've got the disease and you're willing to step up and be part of helping us hopefully get a drug approved, we want to solve that problem. So we are trying to address every issue that we've heard 
We have the National Black Churches Association uh, involved in this. We're involved with all the advocacy groups. We are partnering with ASH. Anybody out there that wants to partner with us uh, in our fight against sickle cell disease, let us know. If we're not working with you, we plan to. We'd like to. Hi, I'm Barbara Harrison, um, genetic counselor at Howard University. And um, so I have a couple of questions, I think for Dr. Christensen and also for Dr. Richardson. So the, what motivated me to stand up was um, the comment about giving results back. And so the challenge that you know was even apparent in the room was the general lack about genetics and how genetics, at least to our knowledge right now, how genetics contributes to health. Um, and the, the rapid expansion of direct-to-consumer testing where these results are just out there, people um, don't really understand how they affect their health. So I guess my question is just around, was there a plan about that translation piece when those results are giving back and what's the qualifications or at least the genetics knowledge of the folks that are giving those results back? Because a researcher's knowledge is different than a clinician's knowledge. That's, I guess, part one for you. And then the other side is I am about one of, I would say, maybe 30 African-American genetic counselors, of which there's about four, three to 4,000 genetic counselors out there, which still is not nearly enough to serve the population, but the number, the diversity within genetic counselors is just horrendous, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, but in any case, I was just wondering, as far as the HBCU um, efforts, I don't know if there are any workforce efforts under that, um, you know, in, in addition to expanding researchers to also expanding clinicians. So, yeah, I was just going to applaud you and say that you are absolutely right. I mean, when you said you were a genetic counselor, I'm like, let's give her a round of applause because it's, uh, you know, so few uh, women of color and people of color in the field. We have a whole team of individuals and committee, and we have a committee that is looking at how we're going to return genetic um, information for the exact reasons that you mentioned. I'm a physician myself, and I've had, you know, the analysis, and I needed another physician to explain it in depth um, because it's so complicated. Um, so we have a team of people that includes, um, um, that will certainly include um, individuals who have the knowledge and can make it very clear to the participants. That's one of the things that our institutional review board, which is one of the things that have come into play as a result of the other transgressions in the past, people need to be informed. They need to know exactly what they're doing and what they're getting into. So one of the things that we have to do is make sure we break down everything into a language that people can understand. So certainly we will be doing that with the genetic information. We have um, um, several people with the National Society of Genetic Counselors that will probably be involved. So a whole committee is looking at how we're gonna do it. And and it's not going to be easy, but uh, it's going to be done well. Okay. And to me, that falls under building the kind of infrastructure we need to be able to take advantage of this opportunity. And part of that would be developing the kind of workforce that we need and expanding on our, our genetic counselors of color. Thank yeah. you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tyson Greaves. I uh, work at uh, Edelman. Uh, we do communications and uh, specifically stakeholder uh, outreach for a number of our uh, pharmaceutical and insurance uh, clients. Uh, a question that I have, uh, Dr. Richardson, you spoke to some of the challenges associated with recruiting um, populations of color into um, research of, of this magnitude. Um, so my question is, what are some of the strategies that have found some success in actually bringing uh, people of color into the, the research to get those numbers up? Well, thank you for your question. Um, People of color want to be involved in research. Many times they're just not asked. So that's number one. Um, so we are asking, but before we even ask, we are actually creating the value proposition, making it clear why people should participate in research. Uh, and we're also making it clear that we are valuing the community, we trust the community, and we're building relationships. So we have a whole team of community partners. First of all, we went to the community and asked them, what would you need in order to participate in a study like this? There were about 500 people that were um, interviewed long before we even began the initial beta testing phases. And they told us they need trust, transparency, respect, honesty, dignity, and they also need to feel that they're going to benefit. Um, so we, just like Dr. Love, have incorporated all of the things that we learned from these sessions that we did all across the country uh, into the way that we've designed our study. 
We also have developed relationships with community partners and trusted intermediaries. It's very important. I mean, you know, I'm nice, I'm fine, and I'm sure I'm fairly trustworthy, but people aren't going to just make a decision based upon something I say. They need people in their community who are willing to actually stand up and say, yes, this is something that you should do. So we're building up a relationship with community partners all across the nation, and also our healthcare organizations are doing the same. So we are blanketing the nation with individuals who are standing up and saying, listen, we got to be a part of this research study. Uh, we're also meeting with individuals. I'll be putting together a group of what we're calling participant partners, individuals who will give us feedback on what we're doing, looking at our website. Hey, this doesn't make sense. So we are involving participants. We're we're involving providers, we're involving community organizations, we're doing a grassroots movement to involve and engage people so that they can be interested and, and know that we are very serious about the work of engaging, not just engaging and getting people to sign up, but doing things that will make them interested in staying with us for the long haul. Hello, my name is Miranda Ward, I'm a faculty at the George Washington University. So I actually had a question for both um, actually the All of Us program, as well as I want to revisit the question that I had for Dr. Dunstan. So first I wanted to know, you answered a lot of the questions that I had just now, but I wanted to know how do underrepresented groups that don't have a medical home or insurance, how are they engaged in the research? So that's one question. And then back to Dr. Dunstan, if you can share the role of changing social conditions and context and how that's kind of accounted for in the Human Genome Project, that would be helpful. Did she say she's on the faculty somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm just, well first of all, congratulations to you, I am so impressed. Um, so we have three ways actually you can get involved in our program once we actually launch. So one is through uh, medical facilities where people have a medical home. But another big component is called what we call the direct volunteer approach. And that's where you can go to our website, and I do urge all of you to go to our website now. Again, we're in the beta testing phase. Um, you can only now enroll through having a special code and being connected to a healthcare provider organization. But once we launch, there will be an opportunity on our website, and it's joinallofus.org, joinallofus.org. And you can just sign up there. And once you sign up there, you can go to one of the partners um, of our direct volunteer program. It could be a Walgreens, it could be a blood bank, uh, it could be a Quest facility, but you don't have to be connected to a major uh, medical center or hospital to be involved. We truly mean, when we say all of us, we mean all of us. Thank you. To be very, if I understand correct, what's the relationship between social determinants and genome? Well, the way, again, maybe you can just provide a little bit more clarity when you were talking about how the genome really allows for that personalized, mm -hmm. um, it basically allows for you to really focus on how the genome and how the variations in the individual, at the mm -hmm. individual level. And I'm just a firm believer. I mean, yes, I agree that there are those individual characteristics that we need to take into account, but very much so as a part of a larger social context. Mm -hmm. And so I want to know how the human genome, what's been, you know, all of the knowledge that's been generated from that, how that's being married with, with what we know around those social determinants mm -hmm. of health. Okay. And again, thank you for the question, too. I think it's fair to say, and I'm glad um, the other panelists uh, can comment on this as well. It's been two kind of paths that um, trying to get, uh, understand the genome and how it's related to health and disease. I would say one camp has been out the biological side with physicians quite interested in therapy. How do we treat disease? We've also had the health disparities group that are very much aware of how the social environment plays a role in disease um, susceptibility and expression. And there's there been great research done on both sides. And um, the health disparity sides have clearly demonstrated that there are social determinants that can be statistically associated with the disease as well as genes that are associated with the disease. The beauty now is how do those social determinants, such as employment, such as things that are tied to what we group under stress, 
how does that get translated into an increased incidence of certain diseases? This is a big area now why I made the point about we really need to be able to look at cultural diversity in populations. Cultural diversity deals with your definition of yourself as an individual, as part of a group. All of us have a culture that gives us definition. What I'm saying is we haven't really done the research on how our thinking about who we are, how we speak about who we are, how we feel about. These are energies that have profiles that can be scientifically characterized as well as the biochemical markers. Now we have this genome mapped, and what we try to do with disease is find patterns in the genome that correspond to whatever kind of phenotype we're looking for in disease. We can now do the same thing with attitudes. We can collect data on how a person sees themselves and what have you. I want to get to, but this is the kind of data when our populations participate. <laughs> and that's why we have to have our populations participate, because we need to get data that's rooted in your cultural view. We need to be able to also include that into looking at what are patterns in the genome that correlate with certain ways of thinking. Because we, we can map the brain now how you think and what part of the brain lights up and what neurotransmitters are released and how those neurotransmitters affect certain cells and how those cells are related to certain diseases. I mean, we have the science to actually look at how we think so that we can look at ourselves how, how we think and how we feel. Okay. We can map those things I'm going to have to jump in here. We are just yeah. about out of time. Um, um, did you want to respond to that quickly? I was just going to just say briefly, that's one of the things that makes all of us research program um, stand out because we are not just looking at biology. We are looking at lifestyle. We're looking at environment. We're also looking at socioeconomic status. So we're hoping that once we collect all of this data, we can possibly see how those um, inter interconnect with health. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to try to push the envelope just a little bit and get these last two questions in, but we need short answers. Sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sandra Long. I'm the publisher of HBCU Research Magazine. So earlier, Dr. Anderson gave me an introduction, and for some reason, I just blew it. Like, I didn't stand up and tell you that the magazine is designed to tell the stories of HBCU research that's happening at the institutions across the country, what's going on in uh, what type of research that HBCUs are doing. And the, we've only been out for six months. We go on Barnes and Noble shelves nationwide starting December, our December HBCU research year in review. Now, I was doing a disservice to the magazine because everyone in this room needs to help. It's a call to action. We go up against MIT Review, National Geographic, Scientific American, and Science, and Science Magazine. We're on that shelf, science and technology. So I needed to tell all of you, we need your help. Go into a Barnes & Noble, buy HBCU research, and the second part is all of the stories that I heard today we need those stories in the magazine. The Genome Project, you, all of us, all of that. Uh, Congresswoman Christensen, we have to sit down with you, and certainly what you're doing with sickle cell, we can get that out in the magazine. So thank you. I'm done. I know. Okay. Uh, you're back. All those, <laughs> you, you, you are bad. All those, uh, is that only research being done at HBCUs, or is it, I mean, what, what's the, what is the scope of that? There's a microphone behind you. I'm, I'm giving you so all kind it, of lashes. I'm it, not looking over that way because I know I'm going to get in trouble it, now. Well, I thought I was going to be in trouble right. with Dr. Anderson. On, so roll. three things. Um, it is HBCU research in the laboratories, their government partners, Army, Navy, Air Force, and then their industry partners. So we cover all three. We want them to collaborate and solve problems. Okay. 
There's research being done at HBCUs, not research being done at, at HBCUs. HBCUs. Oh, but right. don't forget, like they partner with Army, Navy, Air Force. We cover that research as well because they're involved. I got you. I got you. Okay, okay. You got, thank you. I'm, I'm trying to give you a chance. All right. Next. Next. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Angel Hines I'm from Chicago. I'm the chair of the Community Outreach Committee with the Illinois Multiple Sclerosis Society's Junior Board. So I'm constantly raising money for research, um, but I go to a lot of talks so I can learn what I'm raising money for. Um, but my question is as a patient, because I live with MS, and um, I'm looking for, to, I've never actually been asked to be in a research program. So I will sign up and I will spread the word with all of the people that I know and um, that live with MS um, in my network in Chicago. Um, but I'm curious about a type of trial I can get in with precision medicine um, because you know I want to continue to live well. Um, and I'm really, really interested in learning more about those type, that, that work, specifically for like, the disease I live with. But um, you, talked, you, know, you talked about sickle cell, but I was hoping to hear a little bit more about um, if you knew of any program I can get in. I'll grab your card. Okay. And I will do some work on your behalf. Okay. I don't know of any precision development programs specifically going on in MS. I know of some great trials going on in MS and some great drugs, but they tend to work more broadly around inflammation or anti-inflammation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd be happy to take your card and to do some work on your behalf. Great, thank you. And I would just direct you to the National Institutes of Health clinicaltrials.gov mm -hmm. and also the Multiple Sclerosis National Society generally has very good information about the trials that are are appropriate, um, but I, I think between those two and certainly any other, you'll find some uh, interesting studies to be a part of. And one comment, I know we're not supposed to comment, but this is the first talk I've been to on research and health policy where it was a panel of all black people, and I can tell you as a patient, it was just like, I'm like texting my mom, my friends, like this is awesome, so thank you. Okay, and this, the, the last word. Hi, the my name is uh, Daryl. word. <laughs> yes, the quick last word. Brief word. And, yeah. and I'll make it very quick. My name is Daryl Hamlin with the Emerging Technology Consortium. I'm so glad to be here. But I think when it's all said and done, there's a very simple challenge for our community. And that is, this is one of the next five trillion dollar industries. And the challenge for our community is how do we create investment in policy so the more uh, Dr. Love's up there, but very simply, how do we make sure that we own a part of this next trillion dollar industry. All right, thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Uh, this wraps up our uh, health policy session. Ma'am, you have a, oh, what?
Well, I think you're doing the thing that you should be doing, and that is be the change you want to see. It all starts with each one of you sitting in the seats. If you see a problem, you need to focus on the solution and not the problem. And I think you are a good way to end this session so that because you can inspire us to go a well and beyond ourselves to think about the legacy that we want to leave behind. So I hope that you do well. I hope that you're able to connect with organizations like the National Institutes of Health and find out some of these other philanthropic organizations that are providing funds to continue to do what you do. And then use social media to promote the success stories. YouTube, I mean, it's a lot of ways that you can get the word out so that you can continue to grow your business. All right, thank you for your comment. So I just wanna wrap this up and um, thank everyone uh, for coming out today. I want to thank our panelists. Were they not awesome? You can do better than that. We have a wealth full of, we have a wealth, full, uh, not, we have a wealth of knowledge that is sitting before you. Everyone is at the apex of their professional careers, and they could be anywhere. They did not ask for honorarium to do this. They are here because they believe in what they do, and they want to make this world a better place for people of African descent. All right, before I go, I want to acknowledge uh, my doctor mom. Please stand up. This is my mentor, <laughs> and she's the reason why I do a lot of the things that I do, and I just want to let you know in front of all of these people that I love you, and um, I thank you for pushing me and being the wind beneath my wings. All right? So go in peace and enjoy the rest of the 47th Annual Legislative Conference. Thank you.